Welcome to the launch of the Military Balance 2017, our annual assessment of global military capabilities and defense economics from the IISS, and the simultaneous launch of our own online database, the Military Balance Plus. Joining me to answer your questions today are Dr. Bastian Gigerich, James Hackett, Douglas Barry, Brigadier Ben Barry, Nick Childs, and Lucy Berrault-Soudreau. There has been no reduction in the range and number of security challenges demanding the attention of policymakers. Conflict and insecurity continue in Africa, the Middle East, and in the case of Ukraine, Europe too. North Korea still develops and tests its missile capabilities. More attacks in 2016 highlighted the challenges from transnational terrorists. More states are willing to take military action in pursuit of their national security objectives. Meanwhile, the balance of global military spending continues to shift towards Asia. From 2012 to 2016, Real terms defense spending across Asia grew by 5 to 6% each year. However, total global military spending in 2016 fell by 0.4% in real terms when compared to 2015, largely driven by reductions in the Middle East. The fall would have been even larger were it not offset by increases in Asia. After overtaking Europe as the second largest defense spending region in 2012, Asia in 2016 spent 1.3 times more than Europe on defense when measured in constant 2010 US dollars. Western military technological superiority, once taken for granted, is increasingly challenged. We now judge that in some capability areas, particularly in the air domain, China appears to be reaching near parity with the West. Also, Beijing is now beginning to offer for export some of its modern military systems. Across the globe, advanced military capabilities are spreading. There is a growing proliferation of lethality, and the increasing sophistication of these systems risk complicating Western states' military options. For years, China was engaged primarily in the imitative manufacture of former Soviet-era or Russian systems. Now, however, it is apparent that in key areas, China is shifting to the domestic research, development, and manufacture of military systems supported by sustained budget increases. Beijing's official budget is 1.8 times higher than those of South Korea and Japan combined and accounted for more than a third of Asia's total spending in 2016. China's Navy has developed and deployed more advanced capabilities. Work has started on building three Type 055 cruisers. At least 13 Type 052D multi-mission destroyers are in service or under construction, and a growing number of China's modern surface combatants are being fitted with phased array radars. Commissioning in 2016 of an additional three large replenishment ships indicates that China's Navy is resolutely pursuing its blue water plans, as does China's nascent naval facility in Djibouti. China's Coastal Guard is also receiving larger vessels and is now bigger than some regional navies by overall fleet size. In the air domain, China is now seen as the pacing threat for the United States. China's progress in research and development and its improved military capabilities mean that it is now the single most important driver for U.S. defense deployments. This year's military balance assesses that China's Air Force has just introduced into service a highly capable short-range missile in a class only a handful of leading aerospace nations are able to develop. The introduction of this weapon, called the PL-10, reflects the sustained and continuing investment China is making in air-launch-guided weapons. Beijing will almost certainly be able to add increasingly capable air-to-air -air weapons to its inventory in the next few years. These systems will be close to parity with similar Western weapons, while one of China's air-to-air -air missiles has no Western equivalent. China is developing what could be the world's longest-range air-to-air missile, 
Seen on exercise last year and estimated at near six metres in length, this developmental missile likely has the task of engaging large, high-value and non-manoeuvring targets. With a lofted trajectory, an engagement range around 300 kilometres would appear feasible. When it enters service, this new system will hold at risk large, high-value targets like tankers and AWACS aircraft, platforms that would traditionally safely loiter outside the range of current air-to-air -air weapons. Not only is China producing more advanced systems, it is also starting to sell these abroad. Last year we noted how Chinese military exports to Africa were moving from the sale of Soviet-era designs to the export of systems designed in China. This trend continues. China is now, however, also beginning to sell more advanced systems. The PL-10 missile, for instance, is being offered for export and would, if it proliferates, complicate the operations of any Western Air Force. China is also exporting armed UAVs, and Chinese origin systems have been seen in Nigeria and Saudi Arabia. With China now selling abroad its armed UAVs, it is possible that states unable to procure Western systems may now be able to secure similar capability from non-Western sources. For states in Europe's east and north, however, Russia remains the principal security concern. Russia's armed forces continue to benefit from renewed investment with the continuing delivery of improved weapons as Moscow swaps old for new equipment. Russia's armed forces also retain significant strength in traditional competencies like armored and electronic warfare and in capabilities like rocket artillery, which was used to devastating effect against Ukrainian forces at Zelenopia in 2014. IISS data shows that some Russian equipment outranges the missile and rocket artillery systems of NATO's most capable power, the United States. Much attention, however, is focused on the more advanced systems that Russia has deployed on home ground, such as in Kaliningrad and abroad in the Syria campaign, where Russia has employed air, sea, and submarine-launched cruise missiles. Indeed, Russia is looking to distribute these weapons more widely by integrating them onto a greater range of platforms. The Caliber cruise missile, for instance, is being fitted to an array of Russian naval vessels, including an Arctic patrol vessel. For Russia, this gives the potential to distribute an anti-access screen across its fleet, while also providing greater offensive power projection capability. The majority of these systems, including Caliber and most of its current combat aircraft programs, are based on upgrades of Soviet-era designs. Maintaining Russia's recent progress in conventional military capabilities will depend on expensive renewal of its research and developmental efforts. Over the years, Moscow's military systems have appeared in military inventories across the world, not just the ubiquitous small arms, tanks, and armored personnel carriers, but guided weapons too. With these weapons proliferating, and as other states have learned to make them for themselves, the gap has narrowed between the West and the rest in terms of global access to weapons and militarily relevant high technology. In the Asia-Pacific, China is not the only country integrating advanced missiles and launch systems. Vietnam has become the second Asian nation, after North Korea, to begin the indigenous final assembly of a missile based on the Russian 3M24 Uran anti-ship missile. And similar capabilities are now also in the hands of non-state actors, as seen last year when Houthi rebels in Yemen launched an anti-ship missile at a UAE chartered ship in the Red Sea. The deployed forces of Western states and those of their partners risk increasingly facing advanced offensive systems and in more places. NATO is tomorrow convening its first defense ministerial since the inauguration of Donald Trump. If this meeting results in more nations saying that they will reach the 2% of GDP target, that is not necessarily the best result. 
a successful outcome would instead derive from greater focus on output and NATO securing from its member states a commitment to address capability requirements more directly. European states are already increasing their defense spending, although only gradually. While Europe was one of the three regions in the world where defense spending rose in 2015-16, European defense spending remains modest as a proportion of the continent's GDP. In 2016, only two European NATO states, Greece and Estonia, met the aim to spend 2% of their GDP on defense, down from four European states that met this measure in 2015. The UK dipped slightly below this at 1.98% as its economy grew faster in 2016 than its defense spending. Nonetheless, the UK remained the only European state in the world's top five defense spenders in 2016. If all NATO European countries were in 2016 to have met this 2% of GDP target, their defense spending would have needed to rise by over 40%. NATO's leaders should tomorrow be realistic and question the utility of broad financial targets like the 2% goal. In some circumstances, spending 1% of GDP may be entirely adequate. In others, spending 3% may be insufficient. Instead of saying, show me the money, NATO could more usefully be telling its members, show me the capability. Encouraging members to fund increased investment in operationally relevant capability has to be the order of the day. NATO should perhaps focus instead on the other headline target from the Wales summit that allies should aim to spend 20% of their budget on new equipment, ensuring that their forces meet NATO guidelines for deployability. This is made more urgent because of the degree to which Western states have reduced their equipment and personnel numbers since the Cold War. For instance, our data shows that active personnel totals fell across France, Germany, Italy, and the UK from around 1.3 million in 1996 to 716,000 in 2016. Combat aircraft in the UK fell from 411 in 1992 to 207 in 2017. Although there are signs of a reversal of this trend, supported by modestly increasing budgets, the overall numbers now being bought remain low in comparison to inventories in China and in Russia. The military challenges facing Western powers have increased over the past year. Military technologies continue to proliferate, and across the world, more capable offensive weapon systems are being placed on more platforms. China's military progress highlights that Western dominance in the field of advanced weapon systems can no longer be taken for granted. An emerging threat for deployed Western forces is that with China looking to sell more abroad, they may confront more advanced military systems in more places and operated by a broader range of adversaries. Were major Western states to be tested against these emerging capabilities, they would look to use a qualitative edge of the sort that results from operational experience, good training, and sound doctrine. As such, this does not point to an immediate shift in global military power. The U.S. still spends the most and retains the world's most powerful military forces. Nonetheless, Western military systems are increasingly complex and costly, and there are also fewer of them. Taken together with a security environment that is progressively more uncertain, this would indicate that Western states, no matter how large, will in future be able to do less, less effectively by acting on their own. It would argue for more cooperation between like-minded partners. So amid calls for greater burden sharing, NATO will need to refocus on spending targets that lead to real capability improvements, demonstrating its military utility to all and transforming to better tackle current and future security challenges in an increasingly contested operating environment, one that is now complicated by the proliferation of advanced weapons. Moving now to our Military Balance Plus. For over 50 years, the Military Balance book has provided the best publicly available facts and analysis on global defense issues. 
when objective facts are at a premium, our sober and authoritative data is more vital than ever, making today's launch of our Military Balance Plus online database even more important. This interactive product is tremendously agile, allowing our facts and analysis to be searched in new ways, delivering nearly instant results for queries that might otherwise take days of research to answer correctly. Over time, we now can not only enrich the data sets we display, but also provide for continuous updates. This specially designed platform allows us to, live, to deliver in one place our analysis on defense policy, military organizations and equipment, defense economics and procurement, among other elements. For instance, analyzing our equipment holdings can allow subscribers to assess questions like, which countries operate the F-16 combat aircraft? and how many of what variant each holds, or alternatively, search multiple years of military balance data to discern that Russia and Eurasia and Africa were the only two regions where overall holdings of main battle tanks increased between 2014 and 2015. For NATO states seeking to demonstrate the military value that European alliance members can bring to the US, searching our system for mine warfare vessels shows that in 2015, Germany had the largest number of these vessels in the alliance, while the UK, with 16, had more dedicated assets than the United States Navy, and with a number of these forward deployed. Our new database will allow rapid analysis of the organization of individual armed forces. It also makes comparing military personnel numbers much easier and much faster, as in this example, where we compare personnel totals for the countries comprising the so-called Northern Group. The Defense Economic Section allows subscribers to analyze the effect of Russia's economic difficulties on its military spending. Russia's total military expenditure in 2016 decreased to U.S. $58.9 billion in nominal terms, down from $66.1 billion in 2015. In addition, more defense budget cuts have been announced for the coming years as Russia's economy remains affected by lower energy prices and economic sanctions. And so the Military Balance 2017 provides the best available public information on global military capabilities, trends, and defense economics. The Military Balance Plus takes this product to another level, and I would invite you afterwards to try this database in the corridor outside to see how it will help you uh, in your own work. And with that, the team is delighted to take questions on the Military Balance 2017. Uh, it's Masato Kimura, Japanese freelance journalist based in London. Thank you very much for a very uh, timely uh, presentation. My question is about uh, disruption of uh, F-35, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Joint Strike Force, and uh, your assessment of, of China reaching uh, parity in air uh, force. And uh, so uh, Japanese self-defense force believe uh, F-35 must be game changer in air defense. Uh, why uh, do you assess uh, uh, China is uh, reaching uh, parity in the air, air, air Force? Doug Barry on F-35 and Chinese Air Force. The microphone is on. Uh, in terms of uh, near parity, what we've been looking at is where the Chinese have been going, where they've been spending their money over the past 20 years, two decades. So you have a heavy fighter in the Chengdu J-20, which will enter service probably around the turn of this decade, so 2020 probably. Uh, associated with that, you have a range of air-to-air -air missiles, um, which we haven't really seen. That the kind of both the pace and the introduction is is almost un, unheralded, I and mean, the, the U.S. has never really done that kind of pace of development in such a short period. You have a PL-10, which we've mentioned, which is a dogfight missile, which is very capable entering service now. PL-15, which is a, probably an, a, an Amram 120C7, maybe perhaps 120D class capable weapon, not yet in service, but in test. You have a very long range air to air missile, again, we've seen, we don't know the designation of that, again, in test. And the Chinese also seem to be working on at least one, if not two, um, medium-range ramjet-powered air-to-air missiles. 
you put these together and you give yourself a very, very capable palette of, of air-to-air -air weapons. In terms of what does this mean for the F-35, well, it makes the the air environment not much more difficult. That's not to say that the F-35 isn't a very, very capable platform. It is, it, but it makes life much, much harder, partly because of the tyranny of distance. One of the things about the long-range missile <coughs> the Chinese may be thinking about is if I can't engage an F-35 necessarily successfully, what I may try and do is make the F-35's life that much harder in the terms of an attacking the supporting platforms, the tanker. Uh, where does the F-35 go to tank if, it, if the tanker has been forced either to move much further back or has unfortunately been shot down? Thank you. Next question. Yes, you and... Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Dominic Dudley from uh, Gulf States News. Uh, two questions. Uh, first about the Chinese proliferation and uh, into the Middle East. What's the potential there? What sort of weapon systems might they try to sell what, what to, and to which countries? And also I'd like to ask you about the development of homegrown technology by Iran and how capable that is in comparison to what is it's up against on the other side of the Gulf. Thank you. Douglas? Uh, in terms of proliferation, one of the things we've seen uh, over the past couple of years with the introduction of armed UAVs uh, sourced from China, probably in Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE, uh, that may be a result of unintended consequences. Obviously, the US has been very, very reticent to sell armed systems in, in terms of unmanned systems, uh, and some countries have, have looked elsewhere. In terms of Iranian capabilities, I think one of the things we all struggle with is that Iran shows a lot of equipment on parade. Um, it's then difficult to discern, one, how capable this is, and two, has it actually gone into production? Some, some equipment will have done, but quite a lot of it won't, so there's a, there's a question there. And in terms of comparative uh, capabilities, if you look at the GCC, it, it, simply in technical capability terms, they are, they are much, much better equipped. James? Thanks, John. Uh, just to briefly add to what Douglas was saying, um, of course, as we're, saying, we're seeing, China is looking to export more, but it, it has exported, of course, to uh, the Middle East and to Africa, as, as we've we traced in last year's uh, military balance. In some ways, these are legacy systems that are already in the fleets of uh, some Middle Eastern states. For instance, Saudi Arabia operates uh, Chinese origin artillery. But sourcing equipment from a range of manufacturers creates sometimes problems as well as benefits. You've got to maintain a lot of training over a disparate set of uh, equipment. You've got to uh, maintain it all. And sometimes I think what we've seen on operations is the, is the operation of a mixed fleet of equipment can sometimes cause challenges as well as bring benefits to certain armed forces. Yeah, Douglas, going on from F-35, um, its cost in the bureaucracy and the support ability given 20 megabits, gigabits of data alone for the RAF. Is it, is it too bureaucratic an aircraft and who cost it to suck in all this money and not get the capability that we need? I suppose you only ask the question how deep your pockets are. Um, is it an expensive aircraft? You can't argue it's an expensive aircraft. It's also immensely capable. Just how capable, I suppose, we'll only see once it really, really begins to get into service in, 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 in broader numbers. Um, and beyond that, I think it's, it, it's a question of wait and see in terms of the supportability. Obviously, that there will be people looking very carefully at that because obviously through the, what, 30 odd years, 40 years of the service life, you know, your through life costs are, are, are key and people will want to have got those figures right. Sebastian Borger, Berliner Zeitung. Two related questions to the US. First of all, how good is it for the US military to have generals, uh, indeed one general in charge of uh, strategic and defense policy? And secondly, um, you, you talked about the NATO meeting tomorrow. Um, after, what is it, not even four weeks of President Trump, how do we assess the US's position vis-a-vis -vis NATO? All right, well, I might, I might take a crack at both those questions. Um, 
I think the consensus in the United States is that uh, Secretary Mattis, uh, formerly General Mattis, is perhaps the exception that proves the rule. I think he proved in his the evidence that he gave uh, to Congress that he has uh, a, a far-ranging uh, st strategic mind. Uh, he's uh, operated in a different a number of different environments. He's obviously extremely well uh, read. Uh, he's worked closely in his deployments abroad, not just. Uh, with the U.S. military, but also with uh, uh, the, the State Department and, and development uh, agencies. So obviously the United States Congress felt satisfied that uh, uh, General then Secretary Mattis was the exception that, uh, that proved the rule. We'll see in the next couple of days uh, the engagement of the United States uh, with NATO in this uh, first summit that takes place uh, um, over the next uh, couple uh, of days. Uh, again, Secretary uh, Mattis has uh, made uh, uh, a great effort uh, to emphasize the importance of existing uh, alliance systems to the U United States position in the world. And he did that first uh, by his visit to the Republic of Korea and Japan, uh, immediately before Shinzo Abe visited uh, President Trump uh, in Washington and, and Mar-a-Lago. Uh, and the evidence is that uh, over those two days, that special uh, U.S.-Japanese uh, relationship was reinforced. And I expect over the next two days, uh, one will hear uh, two messages. Uh, first, uh, the centrality of NATO uh, to the U.S.'s uh, policy in Europe uh, and the importance of European uh, NATO states uh, really building up uh, their capabilities. Tony Osborne with Aviation Week. Going back to last year in Turkey and the purges that occurred in the military, how does IRSS judge uh, how the coup weakened the Turkish armed forces and when will they sort of come back to a strength post-purge and obviously the loss of so many uh, well-trained people from, through that purge? Well, it won't have done any good for the overall capability of the Turkish armed forces and the subsequent removals and prosecution and dismissal of alleged Gulenist supporters will have reduced their confidence. What I, and there's an essay on this in the Europe section of the military balance. What I'd observe, though, is that the, Tur the Turkish army has mounted uh, what appears to be a pretty successful incursion into Syria that has achieved its tactical objectives, that they've um, achieved a degree of cooperation with local forces, uh, with US air power and indeed with Rus Russian air power. And if nothing else, that suggests that the Turks can concentrate enough, enough competent officers uh, to run a limited operation. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, thank you, John. On, on the sort of parochial point, the British spending, um, one minor sort of question do you measure the percentage figures in the same way that NATO calculates them? Uh, and secondly, if Britain has just dropped below the 2%, do you see this as, as the direction of travel uh, of uh, Britain's statistic? Uh, and if, if that is the case, um, you know, what is going to be squeezed in the defence budget uh, as spending becomes ever tighter? Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, for 2016, uh, the, the spending at, uh, in pounds at uh, 38.3 uh, billion in, in dollar terms at 52.5 that uh, uh, equates to 1.98 percent percent of GDP. Uh, I'll hand over in a minute to Lucy to explain uh, how we calculated that and 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 what we included in that. Uh, the obvious point here is um, that British uh, GDP growth uh, for 2016 was estimated to be 1.8 percent, uh, and and defence spending uh, uh, therefore grew. At a, at a slower rate, and, and hence you have that development. Now, um, if you if you project forward, as you as you uh, um, as your question um, did, uh, unless uh, that situation uh, uh, changes, this 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 trend will will be the direction of travel. Uh, that is in itself uh, something uh, that we have pointed out in the past, and that we now see these numbers uh, come together. But Lucy, why uh, if I can hand over to you to explain uh, how we calculated it, because there's a difference between how we calculated this and, and uh, the NATO figures. There is no international uh, standardized definition of military expenditure. So states uh, such as the US, the UK, or uh, France uh, report different figures to different arenas, such as uh, the United Nations or NATO. 
Um, however, NATO's uh, definition of military expenditure is the most comprehensive. It includes, uh, besides MOD budgets, uh, other forces such as border guards, coast guards, uh, but also pensions for uh, civilian and military personnel, uh, expenditures on peacekeeping, or uh, R&D costs for defense. So to the extent uh, uh, as possible um, regarding available information, WSS uh, attempts to match the NATO definition. So uh, for the United Kingdom, uh, uh, our assessment of the UK defense budget is based on what the government uh, reports uh, to NATO, what the government announces uh, reporting to NATO. Uh, however, um, the, the difference also between the share uh, of GDP depends also on uh, the measure of GDP. So we use IMF figures as we uh, cover 170 countries around the world, but NATO uses World Bank or European Commission figures, so this may also explain the difference. Uh, hi, Grant Semble from Shepherd Media. Uh, one year on from the last military balance, how would you assess European land capabilities, uh, particularly compared with the build-up of Russian uh, land capabilities, tanks, APCs, etc.? Well, we have seen a modest increase in them, a uh, number of modernisation programmes um, coming online. Um, what we've also seen, particularly in regard to Russia, is the NATO Readiness Action Plan starting to bear fruit. So you've had the German-Polish Corps headquarters in Poland beefed up. You've got NATO force integration units in the whole arc of the eastern states. You've got much more exercises, and as we speak, the four enhanced forward presence battalions in the three Baltic states and Poland are building up. And in a sense, that has important deterrence, cap deterrence capability in terms of demonstrating resolve from a wide variety of countries. I think what's also significant is the considerable amount of money and resource and effort the US have put into their um, reassur reassurance exercise for Europe particularly the forward deployment of a rotational armoured brigade, which has also, also built up. Now, there's no room for complacency, and what's also quite important is that NATO continues its dialogue with Russia to reassure them that that is not intended as a threat. Um, but yes, you have seen um, modest incre increases across NATO's land forces. Uh, it's, it's not just about um, capability, of course, isn't just a function of equipment. It's about what you're able to do with it. And I think some of the comments that uh, the head of the US Army in Europe has said over the last year and a half about Russian skills in traditional competency areas like electronic warfare, massed artillery, counter-strike, things like that. And is, uh, the indication is that well, the West totally got out of the business but refocused on 15 years of expeditionary counterinsurgency operations. So it's got to still do that stuff, or have the ability to do that, but then refocus on the old Cold War skills. So it's not just a matter of, a, of a equipment uh, acquisition, I think. Douglas? Yeah, just a couple of quick points on um, armour programmes. I think we'll all be looking very closely at what happens in the next state armour programme in terms of the heavy armour projects, Armata. Armata's obviously slipped. Um, how, how far it slipped remains to be seen. I think it, perhaps indicative of, of some industrial <coughs> difficulty was that Ural Wagen Zavod, who manufactured the, the heavy armour in, in, in country, uh, are now are, are being up, taken over, absorbed, uh, or certainly a part of it has been taken into Ross Technology, which is the large you know, umbrella defence industrial conglomerate in Russia. Do you consider cyber capabilities as uh, military tools or calculate them in the military balance? Well, it, it has military utility if you conceive of it in terms of, um, uh, well, a, kin a kinetic capability. The Americans years ago tried to make cyber relevant to the armed forces by trying to talk about it in terms of um, weaponized capability. And if you think of it as a you could, for instance, degrade a communications net of a unit that's about to advance. That has a military effect. Whether it's a military capability or a weapon in the sense that we traditionally conceive of, probably not. But I think it's, what you have to consider is that states conceive of cyber power in different ways. Um, 
for Russia, for instance, it's just an, another tool of state power. For instance, if you conceive of state power operating on a number of different levers, having a number of different levers, one could be kinetic capability, one could be electronic warfare, one could be cyber. All of them could be pulled simultaneously, they could all be pulled separately. But it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's an arm of state power for Russia. Um, I think in, in the Russian context also, it's worth considering of cyber, of cyber power as an influence capability as well. Um, Russia tends to think of cyberspace as the information space, and cyber is just one tool by which to achieve tactics and capabilities that were traditionally achieved by other means. There are um, three, three key points, all of which are assessed in the book. Uh, the first one is an increasing number of countries are declaring an offensive cyber capability, both to assist uh, their national operations, their multinational operations, but also as an element of deterrence. And the UK has stated that it reserves the right to act against a, in response to a major cyber attack in any way it chooses. The second thing you've seen as the um, extent of the civilian cyber threat has um, apparent, has increased is increasing number of countries have, saying, have said that their military cyber defensive capability is available for civilian cyber emerg emergencies. Uh, what you're also seeing is an increasing number of cyber commands or cyber organisations and indeed the book has a page on the reorganisation of the German Armed Forces, cyber structure and capability. But um, if cyber is to have a military utility, both defensive in terms of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, and offensive, it's got to be integrated into what armed forces do. Now, secrecy uh, surrounds quite a lot of that, but from open sources, the nation that's most advanced in this in gearing their military cyber capability to have effect for tactical forces like brigades on the ground or expeditionary air forces is the United States. And there's a considerable amount of detail in the book about the United States Cyber Command and the cyber elements of their four services. What we're trying increasingly to do in, in the Military Balance and the Military Balance Plus is to track aspects of these uh, developments in terms of doctrines, in terms of organizations, and in terms of budgets. Um, these are proxies for capability, um, so we are in the process of uh, developing uh, methods to, to uh, integrate uh, this new emerging data into our work. That's uh, just one of, the, one of the examples where we can uh, continue to innovate around the data that we present, uh, uh, both in the book and in the database. Thank you. Hello, Irene Hanous, Sharq al Awsat, Arab International Newspaper. Um, the UNSC uh, uh, resolution 2231 calls on Iran to halt any um, ballistic missile development activity with capability to carry nuclear heads. And so recent news has um, reported against that, that Iran are actually developing their ballistic missiles. How might that affect the future uh, sorry, of the nuclear agreement? And question number two, please. Um, Let's talk about um, the non-state actors, please. As you mentioned about the Houthi rebels having very developed um, military capabilities, as well as ISIS, Hezbollah, etc. How much, um, uh, in the, how in depth does the military balance of 2017 go into that? Um, analyzing maybe the black market of um, weapons and. Um, money laundry and etc. Yemen was quite an armed camp before the most, rec most recent war and for example the Scud missiles that are being fired um, at Saudi Arabia, they're holdings that the country al already had. I think um, the Syrian opposition groups provide quite an interesting case study and in this year's military balance we did a quite considerable amount of research to look at the equipment capabilities of those various armed groups. And they have holdings that include armoured vehicles, including heavy armoured vehicles, heavy artillery, and um, other equipment that we would list if they were a conventional army. I think what you have to do, though, and we, we explain this in the book, is you, you have to understand the nature of these uh, non-state armed groups. They may not have the logistics systems that a conventional army has. They also morph, they form, they change, they merge, they diverse. And they also would appear to swap equipment round and to trade it with each other. Um, 
I mean, the other point is, is just as we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan, the non-state armed groups there improvising roadside bombs, what we're seeing in Syria is not just that, but quite a lot of improvisation of mortars and rockets. But I think if you look at the um, Syria part of the Middle East data, you'll see, you, you'll see this borne out with our, our assessments. Um, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, absolutely. Do you still have the mic? So, um, according to intelligence and data, where's the funding coming from and how are the weapons being provided to those non-state actors? Well, there's no doubt that there has been external funding to a variety of non-state actors, but they're also capable of raising revenue and spending it themselves. I mean, ISIS has, run a war, has won a war economy with taxing, uh, with raising money through, through uh, petroleum and also looting and selling uh, um, antiquities as well as, as, well as kidnapping. Um, this doesn't just apply, though, to non-state actors. In the main uh, analysis of the war in Syria in the book, we explained that with the exception of the elite striking forces, such as the government special forces, the Republican Guard, uh, there's been a militiarization of the regular Syria forces and there's a considerable amount of extortion shaking people down at checkpoints. There's also independent state-armed groups, such as the, the so-called Desert Hawks, who act as a sort of fusion between a criminal, a criminal band and, when they choose to, pro-government fighters. Um, the relationship between the deal and the resolution is actually very complicated. Technically, the resolution endorsed the deal. It is not part of it. And the, the way it regulates Iran's ballistic missile program is also complicated because unlike the previous resolution, it doesn't decide that Iran shouldn't be uh, undertaking any activities in this area, but instead calls upon, which introduced some ambiguity in terms of whether the resolution is even legally binding. Then it introduced another ambiguity, saying uh, Iran should refrain from activities with ballistic missiles not capable of delivering uh, nuclear weapons, but designed to be capable. So Iran, of course, has already said, you know, of course, we don't have nuclear weapons, so our missiles are not designed uh, to carry nuclear weapons. As a such, it, it provides a bit of an off-ramp uh, for Iran in that area. But you do make a, a valid point that it has an impact on the deal, because it's tangentially connected to it. It is deeply contentious. Um, it's, a, it's a red line for Iran. There's very little uh, reason to believe that Iran would actually bend to pressure in this regard. Um, historical record doesn't seem to indicate that that would be the case. Um, and looking at what has happened in the US in this context, it's long been a target for Republicans in Congress, which have made various pushes to introduce new sanctions. Um, before under the Obama administration that faced the threat of a presidential veto, that will no longer be the case. Um, so it's. To my mind, it's not difficult to imagine a scenario in which, like the recent uh, missile test, Iran does something provocative, the United States responds, for instance, with sanctions. Iran has said in the, in the past that um, it would view any additional sanctions as a violation of the nuclear deal. With the presidential elections coming up, the, the situation could become quite volatile. So in that sense, I, I do share your view that it could be dangerous, but it's not directly connected to the deal as such. As, I think as we have uh, tried to, to allude to, um, uh, as with all of these numbers, there are many different ways of calculating uh, 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 GDP estimates. Uh, and then there's, uh, as Lucy has explained, uh, there are different definitions of what is counted as, as defense spending. Um, we have actually uh, uh, should be up on the web page now a, a blog piece that explains a little more um, uh, how this is done in greater detail. Um, uh, we are happy, uh, 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 perhaps if we if we can do this in the in the immediate uh, follow up here, uh, we can go over the over the numbers uh, if 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 that is if that is necessary to uh, 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 detail uh, precisely what we have uh, included. Uh, in this, uh, and uh, we're happy to debate to debate, uh, to debate uh, uh, that uh, further. Uh, Lucy, is there anything you, on the numbers that you want to add? Uh, um, uh, as you just said, Bastian, I'm happy to follow up on, uh, on the methodology and on the different 
uh, budgetary items are included in the, in the calculations. Yeah. I'm quite confident, by the way, that the MOD does not contest our statement that the UK is the only European state in the world's top five uh, defense uh, spenders. Uh, so um, <laughs> we're probably all right on, on that score. But there is, uh, I would, I would um, uh, invite everybody to read the blog post because we knew this question would come out. So we have uh, written a, a blog on the website that explains uh, uh, the thinking behind um, how one calculates a percentage of GDP. Uh, for, for defense expenditure. But I think the overall point that comes out both in this statement and the book is that, is that numbers don't mean anything, you know, that uh, everything. The 2% the, the is, is an interesting political target. The 20% the of, uh, of defense equipment is equally uh, a, a good target. But increasingly, uh, uh, as people uh, see the challenges in, in Europe as being uh, more imminent, more pressing, more real, people will turn to analysis of real deplorable capabilities. And uh, our hope is that uh, the debate within NATO uh, turns more in, in that direction uh, rather than um, sticks with point scoring on, pati on particular percentages of, 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 of GDP that is being spent on, on, on defense as a whole or uh, even um, largely on, on capabilities. Bastian? If I can just add to that, I mean, the two NATO targets, the 2% and the 20%, they're both input targets. You know, in our judgment, the 20% input target on investment is a more useful target than the 2%, but both are input targets. We should be thinking about output, the capability that is generated. That is actually what ultimately uh, is a measure of uh, uh, what you're contributing to, to defense in an alliance context or, or otherwise. Uh, and uh, we'll invite you to try that on the Military Balance Plus later on uh, because it, it's very easy to do now. Thanks. Into a slightly different area. We've okay. talked about the Asia Pacific. Uh, you mentioned China's naval modernization. Um, we think we ought to say something more about uh, sort of the maritime dimension in the Asia Pacific. I mean, one of the big things that the Trump team has talked about is an extraordinary expansion of the US uh, naval power. Uh, I mean, is that uh, feasible in the short term? Uh, what uh, areas might uh, the new American administration uh, put, uh, you know, what, what eggs in the basket are the most important in terms of strengthening uh, U.S. naval power uh, in, in the Asia-Pacific region? Jonathan, I, I, I take it you're referring to the uh, global targets, uh, increased targets up to 350 or 355. Um, uh, Clearly, uh, as you say, the Trump administration or uh, President Trump as a candidate talked about a 350 ship navy. That would be significantly ahead of the uh, previous target uh, by the uh, US Navy of 308 ships and, and even more than the current total of 274 ships. Independently, the US Navy has come up with uh, a revised figure of um, what its um, uh, requirements are of 355. Uh, that clearly is, is mainly driven by the concerns that uh, the US Navy is struggling to maintain its tasking and particularly its um, presence in, in key areas. Um, for example, we have just seen another gap in uh, US carrier presence in the Middle East. Uh, that is in part being driven by uh, a priority being given to sustaining carrier capability and carrier presence in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, the key, I think, as far as the US Navy is concerned in terms of uh, maintaining and sustaining and, if necessary, um, bolstering presence, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, is initially on dealing with problems of readiness and of maintenance, and that will be uh, where as some admirals have suggested, their immediate focus is ahead of um, uh, providing over, uh, globally a, a, a larger overall total. So in that sense, a mixed message from, from the US Navy. But we, we in the, the military balance focus in particular on the strains on uh, uh, the carrier force that is, is, is being uh, seen in, in, in presence, in, in overhaul requirements, as well as the demands of of, of combatant commanders. Um, in terms of the priorities for the US Navy as far as capability building in the future, clearly there is an increased focus, certainly in this um, 355 figure, 
on high-end um, capabilities as far as um, uh, uh, priorities are concerned. Uh, the figure includes, for example, uh, an increase in the, in the number of overall carriers uh, from 11 to, to 12, uh, an increase in um, major surface combatants uh, to deal with the potential of the anti-access area denial capabilities, anti-ship uh, capabilities that um, forward deployed forces will require, and perhaps most significantly um, in the numbers of submarines. Uh, and another area where there's clearly pressure on the force, uh, numbers uh, were due to dip in, in the future under the previous plans, clearly there is a, a desire to maintain the US Navy's edge in that respect. In, in one respect, there is not slack in the system, but there is room in the system to do that in terms of industrial base uh, uh, capabilities. But clearly, there will be a huge number of questions around the other resource requirements that all that represents in terms not just of uh, money, uh, but for example, in terms of personnel moving forward if that number is going to gain traction and there will be a further increase. Jerry Lewis, Israel Radio. <coughs> May I ask, in the light of Hezbollah's involvement in the Syrian war, what enhancement have IISS seen which, in Hezbollah which could be used against Israel? Well, we track Hezbollah as a non-state armed group. Um, we haven't seen a partic any particular significant equipment, uh, equipment enhancements, although James, the editor, may, may know it better than I. What we have seen, though, is Hezbollah gain a considerable amount of combat experience. Operating in bits of Syria close to um, Lebanon, it's mounted battalion-level operations, which have seen a considerable amount of close combat, uh, something that the Syrian armed forces appear increasingly incapable of, partly because they want to conserve their uh, shrinking manpower. There's also been a steady trickle of um, Hezbollah, ca Hezbollah casualties. Hezbollah has also demonstrated um, an agility of command, an ability to operate in quite a complex environment, and along with um, armed forces of other nations. And it, it, it's in terms of doctrine and training, and also uh, the development of its leaders, that there's probably been the most significant effect on Hezbollah's military capability. Thanks. I just wanted to pick up on something else you said in the introduction, that the spending in the Middle East had fallen, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about where those cuts have happened, uh, what the significance of them is, and if that's a sort of an ongoing trend you expect. Yeah. Uh, in the Middle East region, uh, defense spending declined by 11.8% in real terms between 2015 and 2016. And 2016 was actually the first time since uh, 2010 that the share of defense spending uh, in this region's total GDP declined. So the main reason is uh, the low oil prices which have affected the economies in the region. And most notably, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, declined its defense spending uh, by 30% uh, between 2015 and 2016 from $81.9 billion to $56.9 billion, and uh, Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia being the biggest spender in the region, this has driven the whole area uh, downwards in terms of uh, defense spending. Ben, just picking up on your um, European analysis, do you think the um, lack of investment in EW capability is jeopardizing the um, ability to build up forces, particularly with the Estonian jamming of a striker brigade last year? If you look at the US and its allies and NATO countries, they have been doing a lot of electronic warfare, but they've been doing it in Iraq and Afghanistan and have optimised their equipment, their training and their operations against a very different sort of enemy than the high-end conventional uh, EW threat uh, that Russian forces pose. And certainly both signals intelligence, i.e. finding transmitters and then, and then electronic warfare using jamming to close down the networks has played an important part in the tactical conflict um, in, the, in the Ukraine. Now, quite clearly, um, Western armed forces have got the message and are busy readjusting. 
And I'd be surprised if the training and equipment of EW, EW units wasn't being, wasn't being adapted. But EW ju doesn't just apply to specialist EW units, it applies to the whole force. And whether operating as um, NATO forces planned to do in the Cold War against a persistent, strong EW threat has been, um, is being properly trained for and properly understood in NATO armed forces, it's difficult to assess. Many thanks. The Military Balance book is outside. The Military uh, Balance Plus is outside for demonstration. And do please uh, go to our website to read our Military Balance blog on defense spending. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>